So Michael suggested that I maybe say, like, give a little bit of a perspective talk um, in thinking about what's next for patchy particles. Um, oh, I have to turn this on. So, you know, if, if I, if we look back, like, I don't know, 20, 20 plus years, like early 2000s or something, I don't want to hear from those of you who were in high school back then, but, um, but I remember, you know, the, the papers that were coming out, right? Chad was just sticking, right? Like 1996, I think, was your first paper, sticking DNA on particles and getting them to aggregate into nothing interesting. But they <laughs> aggregated. But they aggregated. OK, well, the 96, <laughs> in 96, the gold particles went or not. But then, I mean, look at where we are, you know, today. Um, and, uh, and, you know, I remember, uh, in the early, like, early 2000, maybe 2003, 2004, Dave Pine, um, visiting Michigan and giving this talk about this vision of if only we could take, you know, spherical colloids and make them into little tetrahedra and give them valence and they could self-assemble into, into diamond structures, right? And so if you, if you just, you know, go, go back 20 years and, and look at all of the papers and all of the, the work that was starting, the community had even even though um, there was you know there was such a a, a big a, a disparity in in the in the length scales right you had people working with you know you know two nanometer CAD telluride CAD selenide particles you had people working with gold particles you had you know the 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 colloidal physicists working with micron size PMMA polystyrene particles. But it was, there was this common vision that was shared by the community that um, to really, you know, imagine that we could have these particles be, um, to use Chad's term, programmable atom equivalents, and that self-assemble by design, on demand, in exactly the materials we want them to form, in exactly the way they want, we want them to form, with exactly the properties, to exhibit exactly the behavior, right? Re really getting to this, um, this holy grail of materials research to have materials by design and, and on demand. And um, we've made extraordinary progress over the last 20 years, right? There's a lot that we, we can do now, but we've, I, I would argue that we've yet to really fully realize um, this promise, and there's, um, there's a lot of exciting things to be done. Um, and, you know, if you look at some of the recent examples in patchy particles, like Sean Chen, oh my God, what a breathtaking talk you gave today, right? I mean, what, what, you're, what you've been able to do in being able to put these patches, sticky patches, where you want them on particles of arbitrary shape, relatively arbitrary, um, is, is a huge advance, right? I mean, we've been talking about that for like, you know, we, we the community has been talking about that for a long time. And in case anyone missed this paper, by Gary Zabo at NIST Boulder that came out a few months ago. These are, this is a two micron size scale bar here where he uses sugar to do masking and then can put all these, you know, an, an arbitrary pattern that he can then stick, stick things to. And so if you go between these scales, we can really start to see where we will be able to pattern particles. And by we, I mean not me, because I don't ever have to make anything. Um, but still, like among the most complex self-assembled colloidal crystals that that are there, are, are ex ex example of this clathrate colloidal crystal that Chad's group um, made, which has uh, I think 123 particles in the in the unit cell that self-assembled, of course, with um, with uh, self-complementary DNA on a, a shape that's um, a, a triangular bipyramid that's squashed, kind of oblate. Um, and uh, and this is still the the most complex, not most complex. It's the largest unit cell that we've ever self-assembled in the computer um, with uh, with any shape and just with entropy. So this is a tetrahedron who where we snip the corners and the edges a little bit, and it starts out as a fluid. And the orange is just an ordered locally ordered dense fluid, and now it's the crystal. 
right? So talking about these different assembly pathways, right? And all these intermediate motifs that you can get. This is a great example of intermediate motif that, that you can get. But, you know, this particle, this, this structure has 432 particles in the unit cell. And honestly, every structure that we've ever, any kind of crystal structure that we have tried to self-assemble with some shapes, we can self-assemble them, right? It, it, so in, in principle, we can, you know, and by the way, that's only with, say, one particle type. Imagine that we really start mixing together, you know, seven different particle shapes and, and, and interacting patches. And th these are maybe the most complex crystals that we've, that we've um, self-assembled. This is work that's coming out, like, any minute now, they say, in Nature Chemistry. This is work by my former um, PhD student, Sang Min Lee, and T. Um, where, uh, where Sang Min, uh, you know, took, uh, different, different, took the shapes that, that Chad's group had started with and said, well, what if we start truncating their corners a little bit more? Then we can create some space inside these clathrate cages and then we can get, ca we can get cages that actually have guests inside and these, the guests rotate where the host network becomes completely frozen, like the system dumps all its entropy into the rotating guest particles. It's really, it's really cool. But I just want to mention this is in terms of, you know, we, we can, we can predict things, uh, crystal structures with, with great complexity. Um, you know, if you give us a shape and, and, and we kind of know what the interactions are, then anyone here can use computer simulations and, and self-assemble them. Um, but, you know, and, and some of these things are possible now, right? So, you know, being able to change, say, the, the, the Janus balance or being able to just go from, like, an individual spot or something through Janus to um, fully, uh, you know, like, ligand grafted particles possible, being able to stretch particles. Mike Solomon in my department does that by getting, like, PMMA particles, micron-sized particles that are Janus and then... Uh, putting them in a polymer matrix, which he can then stretch, and then if these are heated above their glass transition temperature, then he can stretch these out. Um, you know, we're not we're not quite there yet, where we can just arbitrarily say where we want them. But John and others are going to get us there, right? Um, so, uh, but 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 here's the question now, right? So there's a lot of really cool physics that we could be talking about, but I'm not going to talk about that today. I want to talk about practically where are we going with this? right, with patchy particle assembly. Are we going to be able to move the colloidal assembly by design from the lab to the manufacturing floor? Are we going to be able to, you know, scale up um, particles that we make, you know, not by the thousands or the millions, but, you know, Avogadro's number of particles, for example? Um, uh, you know, what do the experimentalists need to know from simulators and, and theorists? to get to that point. Um, how do we achieve the greatest complexity from the simplest p possible particles, the least that cost the least and, and are maybe the most plentiful, right? Um, to be able to achieve, um, you know, different kinds of, of materials. And can we control complexity across scales uh, to achieve really multifunctionality? I mean, these, these, these crystal structures and some of these small, like, terminal assemblies that we make, that we, we, the world we make are really cool, but 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 they they don't yet exhibit the kind of multifunctionality across scales that I think is will one day be possible. I mean, you know, 20 years ago I was thinking, oh, well, we're going to be able to throw particles into inks that are you know polymer inks that are 3D printed, and then. We'll, you know, you can only 3D print down to some size scale, but we'll put particles in there that are smaller than that, and they'll self-assemble while this stuff is drying, and then we'll be able to achieve all this hierarchical order, and blah, 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 we'll get these really cool um, things. And so I saw Joe DeSimone last week, and I'm like, where is that? When are we going to do that? When are you going to take some particles, take your particles, throw them in his stupid thing? And he's like, well, then why aren't you doing this? Mm, okay. You heard it. All right, I'm waiting to see. 
Really? You have to like throwing particles in the printer. Okay, I don't see. Um, also, what about, you know, how do we get self-assembly into, like, really reconfigurable? I mean, are, are, are you know, um, you know, different kinds of patchy nanoparticles and clotoparticles going to get us to, you know, making um, reconfigurable camouflage materials um, that responds to their environment or to, you know, this kind of re reconfigurable uh, Iron Man suit or something like that. Like, where, how, do, how, how do we get there? Mostly everything that we talk about now is, is static. So if I, you know, if we look ahead now and think, okay, where are we, where, where's the next 10 years? Where, where are we going to spend time? Well, I still, we still have some work to do to get full anisotropy control. And although I know some people here, like Dimitri and others, have made concave particles, most of the particles are convex for, for obvious reasons. Um, uh, but they're, they're basically, they're very symmetric still, right? They're, they're, um, you know, there's some sort of approximation of a sphere. Uh, so we, we still have work to do on getting full anisotropy control. And then disparate mixtures, I mean, I don't mean just like binary mixtures. I mean like two very, or three, or four, or 17, right? Think about multi-component alloys. We need to be alloying these things. But we can do better because we can also, you know, atoms are atoms, but we have all of these size scales. So if we really think about disparate size scales and mixing big particles with little particles to achieve self-assembly across scales, I mean, that's something that has, we haven't really ex explored, right? Um, assembly pathways. Many, many of you in the room, um, us included, are, are starting to look now at the actual assembly pathways, right? Because we know that we can design a particle that thermodynamically wants to be in a certain structure, but that doesn't guarantee that kinetics will let us get there. So we have to understand exactly what the pathways are and understand, you know, if, if, if something's going to self-assemble into, you know, one crystal structure nine, nine out of ten times, but some other crystal structure, metastable crystal structure, we need to know what happens along the pathway that steers it away from the global minimum to a local minimum and then what kind of changes can we do to the particle or to our, our um, protocol to avoid that metastable state? Or maybe we like the metastable state better, right? So understanding these assembly pathways, I think there's going to be a lot of really exciting stuff coming out um, there. Um, inverse design, and of course, AI ML, right? Everyone and their mother is using, like literally my mother is like, I want to use chat GPT. Um, you know, AI and ML. Uh, I think that I, at the end of your talk, you were mentioning um, about uh, you know machine learning, using all of this information from machine learning to help us to understand how to design things better. And I think that's absolutely true. What I think is exciting is now thinking about you know again picking up off a, of a da David's beautiful talk um, is w there's all of active matter that so many people work on where they look at active colloids, but, you know, in the future, we have active matter, you know, we can think about electronic colloids. One of my new assistant professors, Albert Liu, his dissertation was on colloidal electronics, that's the name of the paper, with Mike Strano, um, where he wrote a little, put a little graphene circuit on a micron-sized particle, and now he's looking at putting more circuits, and we're trying to figure out what would you encode in a particle if you could encode something. So we can start thinking about electronic colloids and addressable colloids. Um, uh, Oleg is going to talk on Wednesday and about about the work that his group is doing and show this amazing work where they can they can make these structures where every single DNA uh, strand is addressable to release and capture particles at, at, at will. So we can start to think about that. I know, we've had this talk. I don't want to have this talk well, no, right now. <laughs> Colloidal particles. I know, I know, I know, I know, I know. I know, I'm, I'm using colloids as a shorthand for colloidal particles. I respect that colloids is the solution. I know it's a chemistry physicist thing. I'm not going to get into that now with you. Um, so really starting thinking of colloids as complex, complex systems, right? And I think that's, like, if we think about patchy particles 2.0, then we're taking, 
you know, your patchy triangles and somehow making them active and non-equilibrium and, you know, that's, there's just so much to dig out of there. But then we have to bring in additive manufacturing like 3D printing and that's where I think the action, like that's where we're going to get to, to matter on demand. Um, uh, and, but, you know, those things are hard because it's highly non-equilibrium and all of that stuff. Um, and so we're, you know, we're building out our codes. I know some, some of you in the room use Humdi um, or Syniac or Freud. We're trying to build out some of our, our open source codes to be able to treat all of these. And I'll show some examples of that. So in the spirit of um, everyone's like doing vignettes, I'll do two vignettes. Um, one, so one is on inver inverse design. Um, I want to talk about inverse design. So the whole, the, the whole cool thing about patchy particles is that they are like, in principle, infinitely transmutable, right? We can think about, you know, any kind of alchemical dimension, whether it's the aspect ratio or the, the, the faceting or how the ligands are distributed on the surface or, or whatever it is, right? We can think of these things in a continuous fashion. And so that means that we can exploit this transmutability to, um, to uh, design particles that will self-assemble into some target structure by just using generalized thermodynamic ensembles. Um, and so, to, to quote David, I expect that some of you here have had statistical mechanics. Is that what you said? Something like that. He's fancy now because he sits in David Chandler's office. I think that would be like a lot of pressure. That would stress me out. I would totally like feel stress, super stress. Okay, anyway, um, it would just be a lot, okay. Um, so, right, you, so, the, so you could simulate an alchemical ensemble, right? Treat the particle attributes uh, as thermodynamic variables that are coupled to some appropriate chemical potential, which we call an alchemical potential, which of course you get in the usual way from the derivative of the free energy with respect to whatever that variable is. And that alchemical dimension can be the shape of the particle, it can be, you can have patches and you could move the patches around or change their strength or their size or, or whatever you want. And then you could also put in a design constraint, right? And so you can you can tell it, this is what I want the system to, to, to be. What should my particle look like? So here's an old example um, where let's say we want to we want to find a particle shape that will entropically self-assemble into a beta manganese crystal. It has 20 particles in the unit cell. So here's a unit cell and then we just make a rock, some random rock but convex, because concave is hard, um, convex, and then just copy it, put it on every site, and then tie every particle to that site with a little spring, just a minute, because if we don't, then the system is just gonna say, I don't know what to do with these rocks and it'll fall apart. Um, and so then you, um, and so then we can run this, you know, Monte Carlo in this generalized alchemical ensemble where <clears throat> this rock is defined by a bunch of vertices and we simply move the vertices around on a convex hull um, to, until, uh, to, until the shape minimizes the free energy of that structure. Um, and so here's, here's uh, you know, how it looks like at the very beginning when the particles are tied to their lattice sites and then we cut the spring um, to see if it's stable, didn't then just, you know, make sure it's stable. And then you see this rock is just, you know, um, changing shape, but it's, it's fluctuating around some average shape now. And then you, and then we just throw it back in the box and just do regular Monte Carlo, make sure it self assembles because this alchemical approach is just minimizing the free energy of the system that we've told it to be you know, finding the, the, the particle shape that minimizes the free energy of the system. It didn't compare it to what the free energy would be if it was in the fluid phase or, or any other phase. So the kinetics isn't built in. And then of course, like if I were to go to Chad or Oleg and go, cool, I found this shape, will you make it? They say, no, I can't make that shape. That's ridiculous. Um, I need to have like some kind of sy uh, symmetrized shape. So then you can try to figure out what are the key features, um, the symmetry features. So for example, this for this case, it's, it's dodecahedral symmetry. Um, and that's one way that we, we design particle shapes. And um, you know, back when, when we did this work where we throw, we just take a particle, we throw it in a box and see what self-assembles, that might be at whatever 
um, volume fraction we did that study at, that gives us the, um, the crystal structure, um, right, that's the best crystal structure for that particle shape. But that doesn't mean that that shape is the best shape for that crystal, right? And so by coupling this with this um, alchem when an alchemical simulation, we could try to find what I call the eigen shape, um, for lack of a better word, which is a particle that's in the crystal structure that's best for it and vice versa. Um, and you could do other, so here's just a simulation to try to find like a, a, a diamond, a, a shape that forms a diamond structure. Um, this is, that, that was worked by Greg Van Anders. This is worked by Chrissy Dew and Greg Van Anders where let's say you want one crystal structure at one pressure and another crystal structure at another pressure for the same shape. Well, then you just tie those two Monte Carlo simulations together, make the same moves and accept or reject them identically in the two systems that are held at where you hold the, the you, you set the crystal structure you want in the two systems at these different pressures. And then you can find these out. And um, what's interesting is that the shape that you find is not just, you know, an easy interpolation between the shape that would minimize BCC at one pressure and minimize, say, FCC at another pressure. It's, it's like if you looked at the shapes and you kind of went halfway between, it's not, it's not that at all. So it's, it would be hard to intuit um, some, some other way. Um, this is work by Rosie Sersonsky, who's now assistant professor at Chemie at um, Wisconsin. Um, and she started from, you know, properties, which is really where we want to start in the first place, right? I mean, the structures are kind of just by the way, but, but, but it's hard to, to, you know, we know how to design for structure. I don't know how to design for properties, really. Um, but here is where she, she wanted a shape that would self-assemble into cubic diamond or, tetra or change into cubic diamond or tetragonal diamond under uh, change in pressure so they could shift the photonic band gap to different locations. Um, so there's another example of how you can use uh, digital alchemy to do that. Um, so what um, we've done recently, and this is work by uh, Luis Rivera Rivera, who um, recently graduated, and he worked with Tim Moore, who's here. Uh, wave, wave, there he is. Um, AC and postdoc in the group, and, um, and so they built in now um, uh, digital alchemy, not just for shapes, but for, for patchy, for, for patchy interactions. Um, Pengji Zhou, who's a former student working with uh, Greg Anders, we published a couple papers on how to do uh, digital alchemy for pair potentials um, in like, you know, in an MD simulation with, you know, because then you have to make sure it's consistent with the Nose Hoover thermostat or Raman Perinello barostat. So it's much more complicated to make sure it doesn't, you don't break detail balance in MD, but in Monte Carlo, it's pretty trivial. Um, and so, but one of the things that they also did in, in addition to letting the patches change size, for example, is they use this idea of, of the crystallization slot from proteins. So I don't, so I don't know if you're familiar with it. But so it, it's an interesting observation that proteins that crystallize if they're going to crystallize, typically the second virial coefficient is in some range, from this to this, whatever that is. Okay, so um, that's interesting. So, uh, so what they did is they, so here's the second virial coefficient um, for uh, a patchy, uh, a, a particle with uh, like a hemispherical kind of patches, um, where you can write this in terms of the patch size, the range of the patch of the, of the interaction, and the, and the strength of the interaction. Um, and then they do digital alchemy on the patches, but keeping that, keeping B2 constant. Um, one of the tricky parts about doing this is if you set up a structure you want and say, okay, what, how like strong should my patches be? Then the patches will say, how about infinitely deep? Well, that would work. So that's a trivial solution. That's not what you want, right? Um, and so, um, and so this is one way of avoiding that trivial solution and getting a solution that someone might actually be able to make. So as a first test, they decided to see if they could uh, design patchy particle for, um, for this Kagame lattice that, that Sean made. Um, and uh, um, there's, there's been a lot of work on that, like Xiaoming has, has, has looked at the phase diagram of that and, and 
Francesco Schettino's group has, has done a lot of work on it. So we know everything about the system now. And so this is what the particles look like. So here, imagine it's a blue particle with two white uh, polar patches. And then the question is, uh, how big should the patches be, right? How, how should they, they be set up? Um, and so, uh, so he, they designed it so that the poles are attractive, the patches are attractive, but if they're too far, they're not attracted to each other. The bands in the middle are not attracted to one another. Um, and of course, you can't have overlaps, and that mimics the system that, that was studied in these, in these papers. And so then you run this uh, digital alchemy simulation where you're changing the patch size and strength or whatever, and we can, and, it, and then it self-assembles into this, uh, into this uh, Kagame lattice. So then they did a harder one. So like the snub square lattice looks like this. Um, it's never been reported for a tri-block uh, Janus particle, to my knowledge. Um, what's tricky about it is that it's got these, this kind of local motif. So it's asymmetric. So there's got to be a patch that where there's two particles and a patch that permits three particles. So you might ask, okay, so how, how do I how do I design this asymmetric thing? Um, should I allow three bonds per patch or two bonds per patch or, or, or what? So you can use this, use alchemy and then inversely design it, then throw it in a box and watch it self-assemble. Um, and uh, it turns out that the design that you get from alchemy is, is not an intuitive patch pattern because it tells you that you need more than four bonds per patch to get this snub square structure. Um, and it's not intuitive because entropy is important in self-assembling this. So it's not like you would look at it and just design, oh, I want, you know, sticky things here and here. Um, but there's a lot more work to do. Like I, I mentioned, um, you know, trying to tie it to the kinetic pathway. And this is what I was asking about earlier, Alex, is that I can, t if you, you know, someone comes to me with a, I want this crystal structure. Um, these are the kinds of particles I can make. Can you see what shape and interactions I need? given what's physically possible that will self-assemble into that. And I can design for you something where I'll come back and say, well, it roughly has to have this shape and it has to have an interaction that's like, you know, this strong over this range, but I cannot tell you what ligands, I cannot tell you what chemistry to use, right? That's the big missing piece is that how do you go from there now down to the actual, you know, ligand chemistry so I could actually tell someone how to make something. That's what, I, that's what I was asking about before. Um, so really quickly, I maybe have a minute or two, I think, just to um, talk about like sort of these next generation particles, um, what, we're, what we're thinking about is, is trying to think about making colloidal machines or even maybe little colloidal robots that can like squeak around and I don't know, do something interesting. Um, and so imagine that you had some kind of, you know, some block of stuff and you wanted to you wanted it to move, so a thing moving across the floor, say. Um, then you know you 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 could sort of shear it, get it to move, and then the other piece follows behind. Or if you wanted to like send something and then capture it, like how, how do you do a morphological change like this? So this was work that was done by uh, my former student Brian Van Sater, who's assistant professor at Drexel, um, where he said, well, what if we just take a simple colloidal crystal? of spheres and put a swellable cluster and swell it and deswell it and swell it and deswell it and swell it and deswell it. Well, what that does is when it swells and deswells, it, it produces dislocations. And depending on the shape of the swellable cluster, you can control where the dislocations are created and in which directions that they go, which is why the, the swellable cluster looks so, so weird. Um, but here's something you can do that will, that will slice this thing in half. And the, and the, the gray circles are just so you can watch the pattern changing. Um, here's where he took, uh, he put in two of them and now he can slice it. It's swelling, deswelling, swelling, deswelling. So I'm thinking like, you know, some kind of colloidal particles, uh, 2D with some like polynipan particles that you can swell and deswell with temperature or something like that could be cool. Um, here's a way to make it um, swirl, right? So you can use slice, shear, slice, and swirl. Um, and interestingly, it's, it's, it's similar to this, um, this work on particle robots. This is a three centimeter scale bar 
where they have these little robots and they swell and de-swell and like, but all of them do this and the whole thing like moves around. Um, my student Corwin Kerr, working with postdoc Philip Schoenhofer, is now picked up Brian's work to see, okay, um, can I make some simpler swellable things because those notchy things are, are just too hard. Um, and so he's trying to figure out to, in, to design the pattern of the swellable thing by figuring out where he wants these Burgers vectors to be, like where he wants to send the dislocations. So here's an example of one uh, where he just takes a triangle because he wants to create dislocations to facet it. And this work over here is by a student named Jeff. What's his last name? Damn it. Hmm? McNeil. Jeff McNeil, who works in Tom Luke's group at Penn. And he's making this colloidal crystal, and he's got this little triangle thing here. And I don't honestly remember. I think this is caught in an acoustic field. And, uh, and he's swelling and deswelling. You can't really see it, but it's creating these kinds of facets. So I'm thinking that Sing Shang can make this, right? I like, I saw, like, right? Maybe, okay. Um, but finally, so, but, you know, we want, like, cool, like, oozy stuff, right? Like, really think about, like, the gray goo, right? Michael Crichton's gray glue, uh, gray, glue, gray goo, where, you know, like these single cell organism, you have these, you know, their internal things are, are moving around. So, we were um, we were inspired by this work from Baudet at all in Science Robotics from two years ago, where they made these centimeter scale things, um, uh, where they, like in two D, where they um, they had little active particles and then could 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 um, get them to move through these little little mazes. And we thought, well, you know, what would it take to do that on like a micron scale or a smaller scale? Is the physics, you know, what kind of physics do we need? And what are the forces, the size of the forces like? So this is work by uh, Sophie um, Lee in my group. Nope, that's not gonna work. Okay, let me just skip that and show this one um, since I'm running out of time. Uh, Philip is now, he's, he's coded up three-dimensional membranes, vesicles, uh, with a triangular mesh where you can control the elasticity. We can make the, the mesh elasticity spatio, spatially and tempor temporally, you know, heterogeneous if we want to. Um, and it can conserve volume or area or whatever. And then we throw little active rods inside. Um, and so active rods, uh, if, they're, if they're long enough, they will swarm. And, um, and then they'll deform this membrane and it'll, it'll move along, right? So now we can start thinking about, you know, what if you, we have like crystallizable particles or gems. I mean, there's a, just an infinity of things to do. Um, we'd love to be um, uh, steered in the right direction, no pun intended, by experiments, <laughs> experimentalists who might actually make um, something like this. Um, so I'm just going to skip that. But here's a fun thing where he put it in a prison, like a box with friction and gravity, and that's from the side and the top. It's so weird how we instantly anthropomorphize it, and you're like, go, oh, you could do it, right? Okay. So just to like see like what's, uh, so all, all these are, are the regular old self-propelled rods that everybody knows and loves that are propelled along their axis. And they swarm, but then they 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 bunch at a boundary and and deform it. Um, and so yeah, so there's just lots to do. And I'll just show this last one, which is cool. Is now we can start looking at systems of flexicles of active or and or patchy particles, and see how they interact with with each other. And you, you, they develop these really interesting flows, and maybe even this like two phase kind of weird stuff going on. So, so I just. I thought I would show this in, in case people had thoughts, ideas. Um, maybe somebody here wanted to make something. That would be cool. So um, there's just, you know, on demand is still years away, but we're, we're, you know, we're really much closer than we were, I'd say, 20 years ago, and there's just a ton of stuff to be done. So I'll stop there.
Sharon, for these flexicles, how, maybe I'm just misunderstanding it. They're surrounded by the membrane. So how do the active rods transmit forces to the outside? So the membrane is, um, is resolved. It's a, it's a mesh where the nodes are little particles in NMD simulation. They're connected by, by bonds to one another. So the idea is that fluid can flow through, but not. That's rods. right. So the, right. Yes. So this, imagine that it's filled with fluid, although we have no hydrodynamics in here. And the particles just, you know, they can just hit the... But the, the membrane is basically not going to affect the... If you were to model the, the yes. hydrodynamics, it right. wouldn't... The, okay. That's the idea, yeah. So um, the whole idea of, of the patchy particles, I think, is really interesting because from, again, chemistry standpoint, I think of that as valency. And, yes. and, and in the early 2000s, we, we spent a lot of time trying to modify particles and control valencies, exactly. uh, taking a, a sphere and uh, asymmetrically functionalizing it or a prism and putting it on the points versus the faces, or the vertices versus the faces. With the inorganic systems, we concluded that the heterogeneity, um, the difficulty in selectively functionalizing those types of structures was almost an insurmountable obstacle. What, what do you mean inorganic? Uh, take a gold triangular prism. How do you put uh, a, a ligonucleotides of one type on each vertice and a okay, different type? But that's what you use. I don't understand. Uh, we can't do it well. My, my point is ah, it's extremely ah. difficult. And, 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 and yes. we concluded that while you can do some clever things, it, from an experimental standpoint, it's really challenging. Yeah. But it's going to get me to the, where I think you should be thinking. Excellent. The best example of homogeneous nanoparticles are produced by nature. They're called proteins. And proteins can be made molecularly pure, uh -huh. and they have a topology, uh, that a chemical topology that's well known. Uh -huh which means clever chemists can modify at selective points. And I guess what I'm asking is why not direct your computational efforts to asking if we could take protein particles and place a ligonucleotides or some other ligand that has specificity mm -hmm. anywhere we'd like, Sure. what are the structures that we could make? Because the diversity of structures you're going to be able to make is going to go way, way up. Because it's not just about putting two different types. You could put seven different types yes. right. of, of bonding agents at different points and therefore direct in three-dimensional space assembly in a way that has never been directed before. Have you given that some yes. thought? So we've done some stuff with proteins, but, but my question to you is, um, but then what do you make with that? So now you have this cool structure made of proteins that... You make a lot more than you can make with internet. <laughs> you, you're made of proteins. Oh, are you kidding me? That, 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 that's exactly that, that's exactly right. You're talking about tissue regeneration, and synthetic, yeah, okay, sorry. the types of things you're I talking about, crystal. artificial organisms. I mean, it, it's it's and it's not just crystalline matter. No, no, of uh, course. It, it's that's ordered right. matter, and that's why again I take issue with what you said about the Nature paper. That, that was ordered, highly ordered matter. You, you said it was a mishmash with the the, the, the part of the first particles assembled. The 1996. Yeah. I was thinking like it's Nature. It was like a J-Chem. No. It was nature. Okay, I'm thinking of the I believe you. Yes. 8,200 citations and it's nature. Whatever. Couldn't get, couldn't get 8,300, really? It will be next month. Okay. No, but, but I think if you want to yeah. go down that yeah. path, if you really want to influence, that's where computation, because nobody's ever thought about that. If mm -hmm. I could put, you know, 5, 10, 20 different bonding agents where I'd like on yeah. a particle, with perfect precision, which you could do with an, a, a protein, and you could do with an organic, but you couldn't do with any in, inorganic system that I can think of. Then the diversity of structures you could generate would go up substantially. But what you could predict computationally be, become really, really important because it would narrow down, you know, where are the productive yeah. paths I think versus not. Early on, I mean, you know, we started thinking about putting patches anywhere you want to and having many different kinds of patches, and you know, we had like 17 different kinds of flavors of patches. And then we thought, okay, no one is going to make this for a very long time, if if ever. So, you know, I think most of us started focusing on much sim simpler things. But, but I, I, I right. guess I, I look really at your, your cool. chart, you know, yeah. all the different shapes. Yeah, yeah, you want yeah. all those shapes? Go to proteins. You yeah. can find a protein in almost any shape you'd Interesting. like. Interesting. <laughs> Interesting. Thank you. Maybe. There's a question over yeah. there. And okay, then yeah. this, this is a much easier line of questioning. Uh, so. We know each other a long 
too long, one might think. The active particles enclosed in the membranes. There have been a few experimental papers that have tried to do that. Yes. They always get these sort of like instabilities in the membrane where they get like fingering or, you know, like things that grow out. Yes, like an amoeba. So what sort of membranes are you trying to model or like what would have this sort of kind of regular like polymer-like shape? So that's a great, that's a great question. So we're working with some folks in the department who make exosomes. Um, and so that's one example of something that's the, where the elasticity, it's like, it's not something that would, would finger necessarily, but it might slightly deform. So that's kind of interesting. Um, uh, and, you know, th there's also, I mean, I didn't mention, but there's, you know, there's, there's quite a few groups working on trying to, you know, look at this. Um, um, I think Mike Coggin is looking at this and Aparna is looking at some 2D stuff and, um, Bolfis Bol 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 is looking. Has some things that like you know can separate like that. Things like that. So um, I do, so I don't know what other kinds of you know membranes. I don't know whether these should be just lipid membranes or. I mean, I guess it depends on how what you want for the integrity of the thing. Like if you want the active particles to be able to break through it or. Yeah, simply then, deform it or something. I guess related to that, like if you think about cell-based motility, like actin-based motility in mm -hmm, cells, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. adhesions to a yeah. substrate are like the crucial element That's for right. actually generating motility. So like in, in your model, how is that emerging? Is there's friction between the substrate and... Uh, so he just had some, some, some friction. I don't think it was friction. It was more like he just said, I want, I want a certain number of nodes to stay on the bottom or something. So it crawled along the bottom. It wasn't necessarily something, uh, you know, physically realistic, like dissip dissipative in that sense of friction. But, um, uh, wait, what did you, you just, yes, but, but looking at, so you just said something about the, um, yeah, the cell, cell motility, um, and so you know, under, you know, the whole the, the idea is that can we steer the particles inside, right? So if we just rely on swarming, they're going to go in some direction, right? But what, but if you had multiple kinds, right, and then you could pattern the surface so that certain parts were more rigid than others or more flexible than others, then you could predefine, say, where those little um, pseudopods might come out, right, and and grab the surface and move the thing around. But, I mean, those are really, really good ideas that we haven't even haven't explored yet. Okay, maybe I have uh, not only, maybe less of a question, but more of a comment also following you know, the conversations that was uh, developing a minute ago. And I think this, this meetings like this are very important uh, opportunity for us to, to share kind of opinions. And uh, I'm not sure if I share this notion uh, that, okay, Let's have a complexity like seven different uh, nucleotides and get, uh, well, and so what? I, I have been uh, following the field for also about 20 years now. And uh, I think and what we've been missing and still missing is some kind of a vision, a roadmap, a program like what we get, what what we get, and how? Because yeah. very often the physics that well, we do all this amazing uh, structural uh, engineering computation, but the goal is uh, photonic band gap, which has been around for discussions. I know, that's have like been the around standard for, thing that everyone. Says. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We, okay. Well, and uh, but we need more. I, I think you, you're doing very good uh, step towards. Yeah, we need to have a vision. What we do, how we accomplish it, and and not just building complexity for the sake of complexity. At least that's, that's my take after yes. observing it for yes. years. I think that multi, if you want to combine multiple functions, right, like some kind of complexity in function, then you might need a hierarchy in length scales depending on what those functions are. And I think that might be a reason for complexity. But I agree with you that, I mean, you know, my group spent 20 years going, woo, look at this cool structure. Here's another cool structure. <laughs> like, isn't that neat? But then, but now what, right? What do we do with these, with all of these beautiful structures? So from a fundamental point of view, I think there's a lot of physics to be learned by asking why is it that we can take all these patchy particles and self-assemble them into the same exact structures as, as atoms, right? We know that the forces are completely fundamentally different. But, you know, seriously, I have some members of my group don't go into this big quasi-crystal conference in Israel next week or the week after something, 
because still when we talk to like metallurgists who make actual quasi crystals and they're like, oh my, it's so complicated. You need like, you know, quantum mechanics and all of that. You can't get a quasi crystal other than that. And we're like, you know, you could just throw some tetrahedron in a box and shake it up. <laughs> you make a quasi crystal. They don't, they don't know what to do with that. So I think that from a fundamental point of view, still understanding where, uh, you know, how is structure encoded in valence, right? And like, how, how does, how does that, where does the valence arise from? Um, how do we encode complexity? Like, wh where is that information living? I think that's super interesting. But from a practical point of view of making shit, I totally agree with you. Like, we need to know where, what, what do we want to do with all this stuff? Right? Like, what do you okay. want to do with your okay, crystals that you make? I got to take issue with the issue. Here it goes. <laughs> so, so look, uh, the first part of being able to make something that has the properties or function you want is being able to control structure and composition. Yeah. That will never go away. And, and I think it's really important to say, because I see this in reviews all the time. Oh, well, what can you do? You know, that, that's a nature type response. Well, you know, what, what can you make? Of this? What, what sort of, of, of property does it have? The first part is structural control. Second part is using that structural control to realize properties. And it's not just band gaps, wavelength dependent reflectors, negative refractive indices, um, uh, catalytic properties by positioning different types of building blocks next to one another. Mm -hmm. Plasmonic response. Plasmonic response. They're a whole series. In fact, I think what's really coming around, I think we've taken this far enough from a structural control standpoint. I think it's a real challenge to the computational community. Many people in, the, in this audience say, okay, now we can make all these structures. Let's say we take the limits off and we move from inorganic to or, uh, mm -hmm. uh, 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 organic particles to mm -hmm. protein-based mm -hmm. particles. Let's say we could put different bonding elements in there. What could you make that the world would care about. I and mean, that's what I hammer not just Sharon with, mm -hmm, but mm -hmm. Corey Iden, Monica Vera de la Cruz. Uh, I, I think it's really important what you're putting your, you know, your finger on, but I think it's critical to not discount structural control and, and compositional control, because it will always be needed. The more we can do, the more we can challenge what's possible. And, and I think we will always realize new materials with new properties and new capabilities. When we first made the, the, the DNA modified particles, Goes, well, what are you going to do with them? Well, they're now used everywhere. They're used in diagnostic tools for, for medical diagnostics. They're used as therapeutic agents, siRNA, antisense, now vaccines. Nobody saw that coming. And that, it's the same nature paper. But you make those structures, you find new properties, and you ask, how, how can I use those new properties to uh, create new capabilities? I'm 100% sure that's going to happen from your types of colloids and colloidal crystals and our types of colloidal crystals. Uh, but it's a matter of being able to increase diversity in the toolkit that ultimately allows it to ultimately happen. It's critical to put a focus on it, but I think it's really important that we don't discount the need to always expand what's possible from a structure and composition I don't, standpoint. Yeah, I don't think anyone's saying that we don't want to, that, that that's not important. Of course, you have to be able to control structure. But... No, I, what can we do with these? Complexity is exploding, but, uh, but it, you, what if quickly and easily in many ways. Uh, but uh, looking at other alternative, other fields uh, like block of polymers, I think after first we are given by society first decade, maybe two decades, to just... What's structurally uh, possible. Yeah, what's uh, no, structurally possible. Right. You're, you're 100% right. I agree. To, uh, and if you, don't, if you don't fill in with property, I think it's a really important point. But I'm just saying it's critical to not lose sight of the fact that if we ever think these things are useful, you need silos that are working on structural control, silos that are working on property uh, realization through that structural control, and then silos working on the generation of functional devices and other types of materials that can be used. Those three are really critical in terms of the development field. If you don't get some in the, in the latter two, the first part doesn't really matter very much. I think that, that those, aren't those the questions that we're, we're asking yeah. is, what do we do now with these things? Not to say that there's not more interesting structures to see how do we control things. No, I agree. So Oleg wants to enter the row. Uh, I kind of like feel that <laughs> there is no debate here. I think there is agreement, but I wanted to just add to this uh, debatable agreement. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Agreeable debate? <laughs> and uh, to be a little bit more specific, it's going back to some of the topics that you were showing about inverse design. So I agree with, uh, with Mitri that 
increasing complexity, it's interesting from self-assembly point of view, mm -hmm. but at the same time, I do believe that there are many examples of the community which die out simply because the advances never been transferred into something mm -hmm. tangible, useful for society and so on. And I feel like, mm -hmm. you know, seeing this game and seeing increasing complexity and be happy about this is great. But looking, for example, from the question of inverse design, can we imagine, again, as a roadmap, that now when I'm thinking about inverse design, I'm thinking about design of function, I am connecting this function to the structure. Now, it doesn't mean that I have to get a perfect crystal. Maybe right. it's not a crystal at all. I need to understand degree of imperfection, which we can be tolerable by my function. So connecting all this together somehow and saying that my final goal yeah, we need to understand all this, but my final goal is not just play for the play, but enable some functionality. Somehow to have this kind of a bit, a bit more, uh, I don't know, in, inclusive approach to what we want to achieve. So, mm -hmm. so it's again, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's, uh, um, the same way, you know, active system, active matter, right? So one can look at this as a kind of opportunity to overcome variety of problems which exist kind of typically. So somehow this a bit more uh, tailoring to what it might be exciting, but it might be require using some other ways to inc essentially including some other community of the people. In any case, it's just a comment. Yeah. All right, so we're set a minute over time. Oh my God. It seems like this is a great dinner conversation to have. So I'm just gonna end it here. And Michael would like to say a few words as well. So just a few things. So those are, that are in the conference hotel, Best Western, South Coast, in there will be a bus outside, so you can go back right away. There's no dinner tonight. Just because um, the, um, the KITP says on the first day everybody's a bit tired, but tomorrow and on Wednesday there will be dinner also in here. So tomorrow we start at 9 a.m. So uh, 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 is there a shuttle to the marker? Uh, no, there's no shuttle to the marker. Just, just. And bring the posters tomorrow. Thank you. Thank you.